All right, so I'm going to be giving a little bit of a different talk today. And the title of my talk is Bacterial Genomics and Transplant-Related Colitis. I work in the Myerson Laboratory, which is jointly between DFCI and the Broad Institute. So I'll start with a clinical case. Um, this is a real patient who was treated here in Boston. She was a 30-year-old woman who was diagnosed with chronic myelogenous leukemia. She presented in September of 2008 with a white blood cell count of about 37,000 per microliter. She was found to have Philadelphia chromosome positive disease, but wasn't started on any treatment given her desire for pregnancy. After an uneventful pregnancy, she unfortunately progressed to lymphoid blast crisis with a circulating white blood cell count of about 135,000 per microliter, with 53% circulating blasts. At that time, she was started on imatinib, which resulted in a rapid stabilization of counts, but as you all know, that isn't considered definitive therapy at the point of blast crisis. And so in October of 2009, she pursued curative therapy, undergoing a myeloablative double umbilical cord blood transplant. So the transplant proceeded relatively uneventfully until about day 158 post-transplantation. And in April of 2010, she developed severe watery diarrhea with mucus. A biopsy was performed upon colonoscopy, and she was found to have patchy active colitis with loose granulomatous inflammation. Clinically, she was empirically given antibiotics, metronidazole, and fluoroquinolone, and surprisingly responded. Despite that fact, all of the infectious studies were negative. Um, there were no viral cytopathic changes seen, um, CMV, AFB, Eber stains were all negative, and bacterial cultures were negative as well. There was no pathologic evidence of graft-versus-host disease and no evidence of relapse of her disease. And so she was deemed to have an idiopathic colitis. Um, and having trained as a resident in internal medicine and as a clinical fellow, I'm often surprised by how often we don't know the answer um, to what's going on. And so that's really become my interest. So I'm interested in stem cell transplantation. And this is just an outline of the typical time course of a patient who undergoes transplant. So over here at the zero axis, we see initiation of chemotherapy, plus or minus radiation therapy, and gut decontamination to start the process of stem cell transplantation. Obviously, these are all complicated by things like organ toxicity, and at this dotted line is the administration of stem cells. Throughout the time when patients are administered stem cells and thereafter, they can have a variety of complications that will include things like relapse, GBHD or graft-versus-host disease, infection, and if they're lucky enough to make it to a later time point, secondary malignancies. Throughout this process, however, we see tons of idiopathic complications of transplant, most of which remain a mystery to us. So my central hypothesis is that a subset of post-hematopoietic stem cell transplant idiopathic syndromes are triggered by microbial pathogens, and that these pathogens can be discovered using a sequencing-based approach followed by a bioinformatic analysis. And so the story I'm going to tell you today is basically what I believe to be a proof of concept of this sort of approach. So traditional pathogen discovery in the clinical realm follows the following kind of rubric. You start with a disease, you suspect an infection, you send blood or body fluid or tissue to the micro lab, and they try to isolate a potential pathogen using traditional techniques. Um, if they're lucky enough to identify a pathogen, and let's say if it's new, what you see is an organism that we can then do things like sequencing for. And that's really what we do at the Broad Institute. We sequence everything that we can get our hands on. But our lab, at least a subset of our lab, is really interested in using the sequencing technology to unbias microbial investigation. So instead of having to introduce the inherently biased step of knowing how to isolate a potential pathogen, we go through sequencing first, because like I said, that's what we do. Um, and so what we do is we start with a disease, we then perform whole genome sequencing, and we try to identify a pathogen from human body tissues. So how do we do pathogen discovery by next-generation sequencing? This is a schematic that outlines what you get when you do a next-generation sequencing experiment. Um, basically, this is a human reference genome. Um, you can see this is chromosome 1, chromosome 5, and a little area for non-human sequences. What we do when we do next-gen sequencing is we generate these short reads. And these short reads can then be aligned to the reference sequence. Using this approach, you can identify things like point mutations, indels, homozygous deletions where you have no reads lining up to an area, 
hemizygous deletions where you have half the number of reads you would expect, gain, copy number gains, translocations where you have reads that are aligning both to chromosome 5 in this example and chromosome 1. But what I'm really interested in is these non-human sequences. And so this is really what most cancer genomicists throw away. Um, and so this is the trash to most people uh, at the Broad. Um, but this is really where I think all the treasure lies. And this is where we can identify potential pathogens by identifying pathogenic nucleic acid sequences. So in this particular disease um, that I described in the case presentation, um, this was known as cord colitis syndrome. It was first described in September of 2011 and was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was described as an idiopathic, antibiotic-responsive diarrheal syndrome. It only affected umbilical cord blood transplant patients between about 60 days and one year after transplantation. That is to say that they had fully recovered their counts and were no longer neutropenic. There were 11 histopathologically confirmed cases between 2004 and 2011 at a single institution. So while it was institution specific at the time of initial report, it did not seem to be an outbreak or an epidemic. Furthermore, all microbiology studies were negative. In this representative slide, you can see the cross-section H&E stain of a colon biopsy of a patient with cord colitis. Here you can see abnormalities of the crypts where you see some paneth cell metaplasia, which is a sign of potential infection, as well as here at the base of the crypt, an epithelioid granuloma. And remember, granulomas are the sort of things that we see with TB and also in idiopathic diseases like sarcoid. So I became interested in this because it really looked and smelled for all intents and purposes like an infection, even getting better with antibiotics, but they couldn't find a bug, despite the fact that they tried very hard. And so I decided to use this as my test case with our next generation sequencing platform. So this is basically the approach that I take when we do these sorts of experiments. We start with archival tissue, so we've spent a lot of time in the lab trying to optimize extraction of RNA and DNA from formalin fixed paraffin embedded biopsies. We suppose that these tissues are a mixture of human cells, which are these pink blobs, viruses, and bacteria, um, and that these organisms that are present, if they're causing infections, um, should represent that tissue. We then perform DNA or RNA extraction in bulk, and we then posit that the mixture of DNA that comes out should roughly reflect the mixture of cell types and particle types in the original tissue. So this is the actual samples that I used. I took all of the patients who were in the original cord colitis syndrome cohort, all 11 patients, and I limited myself to studying only patients for whom biopsies were available both before and after antibiotic therapy. This brought me down to an experimental cohort of five patients, and I obtained all of their biopsies. Um, the biopsies are extremely tiny. These are about four millimeters cubed. And so when we took slices of those biopsies from these FFPE blocks and extracted DNA, there were only a small subset in which I had enough DNA to do next generation sequencing. In this case, about 25 nanograms was our limit. Luckily for me, I had two patients for whom I had biopsies available both before and after antibiotic therapy. In all the other cases, I reserved the DNA that I was able to extract as a validation cohort, and I'll come back to that later. So what we do with our computational taxonomic classification platform is we start with this DNA. We perform next generation sequencing, as I previously described. That generates a bunch of mixed reads. And here, each read is basically depicted as a bar. And the color of the bar represents the cell of origin. So in this case, Pink represents human, uh, human cell of origin. We then take these mixed reads and we iteratively align these reads to a reference genome. So we start with the human genome, and everything that aligns to the human genome, I bin out. Um, and actually, I toss. So this is what everybody else would be interested in, but this is not what I focus on. I spend a lot of time thinking about the non-human reads. And what we do is we, once again, iteratively align to all reference genomes that are published in the NCBI database. So this includes fungi, viruses, bacteria, and we categorize them. So with each read, I will align it to the genome and label it as salmonella, E. coli, and so on and so forth. And usually, we're left with a very small number of unmapped reads at the end of this process. However, when we did PathSeq analysis of the cord colitis syndromes, what I found was that I had a large number of unmapped reads, which really led us to scratch our heads. 
So in this slide, this is the raw data. Um, I will take you through it slowly. Um, but here we have patient 5 and patient 11. Each column represents a patient biopsy. B represents the biopsy before antibiotics. C and D represent time points after antibiotic administration. Uh, you'll see that the read lengths are slightly different because I performed sequencing at two different institutions so as to limit the possibility of contamination. What I'm going to draw your attention to is here, which is the unmapped reads. Um, so you can see we take out human reads, we then align to known bacteria, known archaea and fungi, and known viruses. But what you see here is that the number of unmapped reads is almost double the number of known bacterial reads. Um, this is very unusual. When I had started in the lab, I did a little project with folks here at the MGH Center for IBD studies on Crohn's disease. And in similar types of biopsies, I ended up with about 20,000 to 30,000 unmapped reads per sample. And so I knew that this was really out of the range of normal for colon biopsies. So we asked ourselves, why are there so many unmapped reads? There are really two major kind of reasons that this could happen. One is a classification error, and the other is that there is a genome or genomes missing in the database. Remember, my entire approach relies on the fact that I take these reads and I align them only to known genomes. So if the genome isn't known, the organism hasn't been discovered and sequenced, there's no way for me to assign a name to it. So pursuing the second hypothesis, we decided to do the following. We took all of the sequences, so these are all of the reads that are non-human, and tried to find areas of overlap between the reads. Everywhere where there was an overlap, we basically assembled the reads to one another, kind of daisy chaining them together. And this is called the generation of contigs. And so when you're able to get reads to line up together, you can generate a contig. The idea being, well, maybe each individual read is too divergent from known organisms in order to meet our strict homology criteria. But if I lengthen that into, let's say, a contig of 1,000 base pairs, then I can be less stringent. And maybe I'll be able to find that this is a relative of E. coli, for example. So when we did this, we did this only with patient 11 samples so that we could come back to patient 5 samples as an independent validation. And patient 11 had about 4.6 million unmapped reads, or non-human reads. We applied a computational assembly algorithm, and this actually relies on the use of graph theory, which is a, a math method, to generate contigs. And in this particular case, we ended up with a very astonishing result. We ended up with about 7.6 million nearly contiguous base pairs of reads. This was in 99 different pieces, with a maximum contig length of about 335,000 base pairs. The mean contig length was 77,000 base pairs. And just by way of comparison, when I did the same thing with my Crohn's disease samples, I would end up with contigs that were about 1,400 base pairs long. Um, so this was really exciting. But it still led us to ask the question of, well, do these contigs, these 99 contigs that are about 7.6 million base pairs in length if you combine them all together, are they from many different organisms? Bacterial genomes are anywhere between 2 megabases to about 12 or 13 megabases. And viral genomes are about 10 KB, so this could have been multiple genomes, or it could be all from one organism. And so in order to investigate that, we used a program available at the Broad Institute called Gamer to look at these contigs individually. And so what we do is we take each contig and represent it as a circle. The size of the circle indicates the size of the contig. So the largest contig here is represented by the largest circle. We take that contig and we blast it to the NCBI database and we see what it's most related to. And its top hit indicates the color of the circle. And so what you'll notice is the vast majority of these circles are red in color, which means that their top hit was a Brady rhizobium species. We then plot them on this graph. On the x-axis we have percent GC content, and on the y-axis we have coverage. Most organisms, if you integrate over a long enough area of sequence, have a fairly stable GC content. So you can tell, if you were to give me 300,000 base pairs of a human genome and a mouse genome, I could tell you if it was human or mouse based on the percent GC content, because humans and mice have 41 and 42 percent GC content. So if, if these contexts are from the same organism, what you should see is that they kind of cluster in a small range of GC content, and we certainly see that. The coverage indicates the number of reads that 
aligned to that contig, corrected for the size of the contig. And once again, you would expect that you'd have fairly similar coverage for each of these contigs. I will spare you the, the gory detail, but we went through each and every one of these contigs independently, um, and we did the following sort of analysis. We took that contig, we in, looked at its percent GC content, its coverage, its top blast hit, and we decided whether or not it should be included with the others. So which one of these belong together and which ones belong apart? And to make a long story short, this is the only thing that we decided to definitively exclude. It has a lower GC content, lower coverage, and its top blast hit is a send virus, um, and therefore not similar to everything in this red box, which really seems to be mostly hitting organisms like Brady rhizobium or related organisms such as Rhodopseudomonas and Cynorhizobium. So to make that kind of leap forward, we went through all of those different contigs. We decided to exclude that one contig from a send virus, and so we decided that 98 of these 99 contigs likely belong to a single organism. So what is this organism? Just to kind of bring everybody back up to speed, we started with this weird diarrhea that happened in patients after transplantation, got better with antibiotics. We sequenced patients' biopsies in order to identify a potential causative organism, and we're left with a lot of unmapped reads. We decided that there might be a new organism there, and so we assembled those reads into longer contigs using a computational algorithm. And at the point where we are now, we have a draft genome of what we believe to be a novel species. So we took these, this new genome and we tried to phylogenetically classify it so that we could figure out essentially what to name it. We applied this uh, algorithm that's been developed by folks at the Harvard School of Public Health called Phyloflan, which uses 400 different core genes, compares them to one another, and allows us to place this organism in a phylogenetic tree. What you see here is that the cord colitis syndrome organism maps to here, um, pretty distantly related to Brady rhizobium japonicum. Based on its location within the phylogenetic tree and the fact that we found it in the gut, I relatively uncreatively called it Brady rhizobium enterica. Its closest relative is Brady rhizobium japonicum, which I bet none of you have had the reason to think about probably since about middle school. Um, Brady rhizobium japonicum is a very important organism in agriculture, um, and you know, the USDA 110 after that might give that away. Um, Brady rhizobium japonicum is actually found in the roots of plants. It's an endosymbiont of plants. Uh, it's very, very important for soybean agriculture, and what happens is this gram-negative rod invades plant roots and fixes nitrogen for the plants, which is extremely cool but leaves you scratching your head when you think about the fact that I found this from the colon of patients with diarrhea. So we wanted to know how different this new organism, Brady rhizobium enterica, was from its closest relative, this agricultural organism. And so we decided to compare the genomes of one of, of these two organisms. This is a circos plot that represents the comparison between B. enterica and B. japonicum. Um, here, each green bar represents a different contig. Because I don't know the ordering of the contigs, I just put them in by descending order size. On the inside track, which is what we'll focus on, the dark blue lines indicate a gene that is present in Enterica but absent in Japonicum. And so you can see that there are a lot of dark blue lines here. And these genes include things like filamentous hemagglutinin. Um, filamentous hemagglutinin is found, for example, in Bordadella pertussis, the causative agent of whooping cough. Um, and these are actually long, sticky genes that are on the extracellular surface of the organism and allow Bordadella pertussis to bind to the human airway epithelium. And so this, we thought, was kind of interesting because maybe this is what is allowing Brady's, Brady rhizobium enterica to bind to the colonic epithelium. We also found genes that were critical for carbon fixation, and notably, we also didn't see a lot of the genes that you would expect for nitrogen fixation and nodulation, which are really kind of plant endosymbiotic-specific genes. Remember that we assembled the genome of this organism from only patient 11, and so we wanted to ask, what are these unmapped reads in patient 5 from? And so what we did was run our algorithm again, the PathSeq algorithm. This time we added B. enterica to the reference database. When we did so, you'll see that the number of unmapped reads went from about 400,000 to 20,000, about 100,000 to 20,000 in patient 5 as well. 
suggesting that B. enterica was not only present in patient 11, but was also present in patient 5, who had a similar disease. Pictorially depicted, if this pie graph represents all bacteria, blue represents B. enterica, red represents all other bacteria, and you can see that not only was B. enterica present in these biopsies, it was the predominant organism in these biopsies. And I bring your attention to this because, remember, this disease was very, very carefully studied. And this organism was not a rare organism. It was actually the most common one around. But our traditional microbial diagnostics failed to identify it. We decided to see if B. enterica is present in you, me, and everybody, um, and it just outgrows under the weird conditions of post-stem cell transplant patients' guts. And so what we did was did PCR with a B. enterica-specific primer in normal colon, colon cancer, and graft-versus-host disease samples. Uh, and what you can see here is that it's absent in all of these control types. However, it is present in additional patients with cord colitis syndrome, as you can see over here. I'll draw your attention to patient 6. Patient 6 is a patient who had had an earlier colon biopsy for CMV colitis, and you can see that at that time, there was not very much B. enterica present. However, after the diagnosis of cord colitis syndrome, indicated by the blue arrow, you can see that there is quite a bit of B. enterica present within the biopsy. We then decided to push this a little further and figure out definitively if this organism was present within tissue. Um, up on the top panels, we have a cord colitis syndrome colon biopsy. On the bottom panels, we have a control. Here, what I've done is I've taken a eubacterial probe, stained in green, and stained a colon biopsy section. You can see a lot of the little green dots indicating where bacteria have invaded into the lamina propria. And this is at a higher magnification. We had also made bradyrhizobium enterica specific probes, labeled them in pink. And you can see that almost everywhere where there's a green dot, there is a pink dot, suggesting that bradyrhizobium is present within the tissue of these patients. So what I've demonstrated today is a process whereby we reverse pathogen discovery. Instead of starting from a disease and isolating a potential pathogen and then taking it forward for more further characterization, we went from a disease through the process of sequencing to identify a novel organism. Right now, I'm doing ongoing work to try to isolate the potential pathogen. So I have kind of a funny quandary now. Usually when you identify a new organism, you have it in hand, um, but I only have its genome. Uh, and so this is work that is ongoing. But what I've told you today is the first demonstration to our knowledge of assembly of a novel bacterial genome from a human tissue specimen. We discovered a novel bradyrhizobium species with a potential disease association and discovered a candidate etiologic organism for cord colitis syndrome. As I mentioned, I'm planning to work on some additional complications of stem cell transplant, which include other colitis syndromes, as well as probably more importantly, pulmonary complications of stem cell transplant, trying to identify candidate pathogens. And I'm also working to isolate and culture the organism and characterize it in cell line and animal models of colitis. So with that, I want to thank all of you for listening um, and a vast crew of uh, collaborators and friends who have helped me in this process. So assuming we've gotten a, not adopted spontaneous generation as a hypothesis, um, is it that your PCR for this pathogen in controls, which appear to be negative, was just insufficiently sensitive to find the organism? I think that's very po possible. Um, so we're in this position of now trying to identify where this organism came from. I don't think you know there was parthenogenesis in these particular samples, um, and so it's very possible that PCR is insensitive to identify a very low abundant organism. We've been looking in you know, soil samples, a lot of other metagenomics uh, studies that have characterized potential sources of this organism um, to try to find it. Um, I'm also in the process of trying to investigate a couple of potential you know, hospital specific sources. And so I think it's still an open question as to where this came from. Um, it's very possible that it's actually from normal patients. So we're also trying to sequence normal patients. When you, the samples that you took, were they just free bacteria in stool, or were they, could it be that this bacteria is hiding out in a symbiotic relationship in a way that's not usually extracted by your methods, and then it 
Yeah, that's very well within the range of possibilities. I think that it was obviously incredibly abundant here, and that's why it was easy to find. And um, we use the same approaches when we isolate DNA from normal samples and also samples from umbilical cord blood uh, GVHD. And so I actually have samples from MGH, so a second institution that I've sequenced, both normal samples and GVHD samples. And for example, in those GVHD samples, we do find a very, very low titer of B. enterica, suggesting that at least it is present in another institution and in a different disease, um, but you know, many, many log fold different. So uh, the question was, what is the numerator and denominator? How many cases have I looked at? How many have been positive? And is this restricted to only this particular idiopathic complication? Or is this organism in other types of colitis that we see post-transplant? So to answer your first question, I have looked at five of the patient's biopsies. All five of them were positive at the time of cord colitis syndrome, the di diagnosis. Remember, there were 11 in the original cohort. Um, but from a practical perspective, what had happened was for the publication of the first paper, they had done a ton of additional special stains. So the tissue has basically been used up. Um, in our own transplant center, I've been trying to aggressively identify new cases. Uh, of course, we don't do that many umbilical cord blood transplants here in Boston, but we still do a fair number. and so. The number of umbilical cord blood transplants over the course of the seven years that this cohort was studied was about 110. Only 10% of them developed cord colitis. So extrapolating from that, we'd expect only about a case a year. Um, so I have been looking into it, but I don't know yet. Uh, in answer to your second question, certainly with the sequencing studies of the samples from the MGH cohort of a lot of controls now, we are seeing very, very low titers of B. enterica, but I'm actually in the process of trying to broaden this out. I'm also working with the Bone Marrow Transplant Clinical Trials Network. I'm on the regimen-related toxicities group uh, to create a, a biospecimen repository of both stool and colon biopsies that we can study definitively. Uh, because my hypothesis is that, you know, not that B. enterica causes every problem in the world that's related to transplant and diarrhea, but rather that there may be additional organisms that we don't yet know about. Um, so I'm going to try to pursue that over the next few years. So are you also thinking about other types of transplant, organ transplant, for instance? I have started to think. That's a great question. I have just started to think about it. I think as a Hemong fellow, I use the word transplant kind of willy-nilly and often forget that organ transplant is a part of that. And so I've started to think about you know, potential complications of organ transplant. But I'm, I'm, my thinking about it is in its infancy.